Awesome. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Startup Studios podcast with Rod and Seth. Um, we are super excited to welcome our next ga- uh, welcome our next guest, my friend Ali Maruyan, who is also a San Jose State alumnus like myself. So a lot of our guests will have that in common because I, I yeah. use my network very well. But over the years, um, as we get into Ali's story, uh, one of the things um, <clears throat> I've we've kept in touch over the years, we first met about 10, 11 years ago, uh, first so. through San Jose State Entrepreneurship kind of organizations. Then when I started my own um, kind of incubation center, and then because I knew of Ali's background and his uh, his connections with VC, he's been one of my go to people over the years for every crazy stupid idea I've had. Um, just as a pin stick, and <laughs> like, hey, Ali, can you turn it out? So I I really appreciate you uh, for that as well as being uh, being with us on the podcast today. Welcome, Ali. Yeah, thanks you guys. Thank you guys for having me. Looking forward to. Have a nice chat with you guys. So I'm also super excited to introduce my boy Raj. Um, so Raj, actually, you want to introduce yourself and what what you bring to the table? Yeah, I don't bring much to be honest. Um, no, my background on the banking side, I started, um, you know, on the IB and, and, and the investment banking side, and then I kind of quickly moved to my passion, which was uh, trading. So I ran a derivatives fund for about twelve years, um, PKU and about a billion two. Had our exit, and then kind of just been having fun. Um, brick and mortar. I've always been on the wellness side. Um, collegiate athlete, uh, five physicians in my family, so I have kind of a healthcare background. But now in a startup SaaS solution, and and way outside over my skis, and, and really excited about it. So Ali, would be I'm wildly interested in kind of the entire pedigree. I heard thirty years of here, fifteen years of here, kind of from soup to nuts. It seems like you've run the gamut. So uh, this will be really helpful for a lot of our founders as well. A lot of people out there right now being like, man. What the heck do I do? <laughs> yeah, there's so many different perspectives from different angles and happy to share and, and also learn more about what, what you're involved with. I know it's the first time we're connecting. And what I've always found is um, just having a chance to talk to different people and you never know where there's synergies or opportunities to share resources and collaborate. I mean, I we, we just met. Um, I can guarantee you before the end of this call, we'll probably figure out one, two, or maybe even three, three different opportunities to work together yeah. on. Of course, um, because that's that's how it turns out. So that would be the first thing that I recommend to everybody is take meetings, talk to people, share. Um, and when you share things, things kind of happen. So looking forward so, to chat. And and Ali, you just get in there too, because when we, I'm sure we're going to get into that. And I, I'm sure I fight it. I'm sure a lot of people fight it. That imposter syndrome, the imposter syndrome of being like, oh my God, this meeting, I, I don't know what I'm going to do. Like, you don't want to raise your hand. So there's there's going to be a plenty, plenty yeah. of that, especially, you know, hopefully give us some tips and tricks. You know, imagine everybody naked type thing. We'll see how yeah, it goes. Just be yourself. I mean, that's that's it. I mean, that's that's what people, um, what resonates with people, I think. That's what I've learned is I think the people that try to. Um, that try. <laughs> can be uncomfortable, but if you're, if you're, people know when you're being genuine, even if you're nervous, you know, or, or you're, in over in over your head i i think people um get that because everybody's had those experiences and i think the ones that stay true to themselves and stay within their lane um and and be comfortable others others sense that and and that's when opportunities evolve it's when you start going outside that and um that you lose productivity and and even just any kind of cohesion in the conversation so yeah happy to I would dive right in. Awesome. No, the, and and with that, actually, uh, so welcome, and let's uh, exactly as you said, let's dive right in. Sure. Who is Ali Maruyan? Yeah, um, n- nothing special. I mean, I'm not going to sit here and claim I'm, I've had three exits. I've done this. I've invested in this and that. No, um, I d- I don't have that kind of pedigree. Um, but I've I've been close to a lot of that. Um. And, um, where I know I, for me, I never thought it had a great amount of value until I started talking to other people. Um, and it was when I was talking to people that I, I always considered way more advanced, successful, whatever adjective you want to put in front of that. I, I always, Check they were the boxes, league, right. Um, and when they were impressed with what I had to share, it, it kind of surprised me and and I think that's that's what um, you you notice no matter where you are, um, you can talk to the most accomplished person um, in any industry, 
Um, but as soon as you start talking about something that they aren't familiar with, that they're curious to learn too, you know, and, and, and I think that I had that experience. So, um, my background grew up in the Bay area, um, lived there for, you know, just over 30 years. Um, I'm not an engineer or technologist, um, by experience or, um, education, I should say. I mean, I did all my schooling, like safe brought up at San Jose state. I did my bachelor's there and went back and did my MBA there too, shortly after. Um, but it's hard to spend any kind of any significant amount of time in the Bay area and not get exposed to tech in some way, shape or form. So my, um, I would say initial exposure to tech was probably, um, hardware. So, I mean, I, my first job, I think, out of out of my bachelor's was working for Applied Materials, um, which, if you don't know, most people know Applied Materials is in the semiconductor industry. But if you talk about semiconductor, who do people think of? They think of the Intels of the world and the AMDs of the world, right? Because they're known for the chip make, chips, because everybody knows there's chips in everything now. Um, but Applied Materials is the company that makes the equipment that the Intels and the AMDs of the world use to make those chips. Um, so uh, that was interesting. It wasn't really for me. It was a very engineering focused technical role again, which I wasn't. Um, but that was that was my first foray into 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 tech. And then I was doing my MBA at the same time. And um, this is this is early, so this is late '90s. And this is when we were starting to see all the dot com stuff just starting to gain traction. And um, I got involved with a company who had already gone public at the time when I joined um, called AutoWeb. And they were, they were basically just doing a marketplace for consumers to shop for cars. And um, it was really interesting because they didn't start that way. Um, so they started as a website design company. Right. And they figured out that every they knew that every company, whether you were Coca-Cola or you were the mom and pop sandwich shop on the corner, you were eventually going to need your own website. You need you needed to have an online presence. And this is very, very basic back then. Right. And so they just it was started by two two um, siblings um, and they said, we're just going to go to one of the most archaic businesses, meaning car dealerships. <laughs> You know, these guys are not used to working with computers or anything. They're, it's true sales in person. And they said, we're just going to go pitch to them that, you know, we can we can build your website um, for your for your dealership. That's how they started. So they just went door to door knocking, um, signing up car dealerships and building their websites. Well, guess what happened? They started noticing that the traffic was coming online. Right. And so they said, well, we don't want to just get a few bucks to build a website, you know, plug it into a template and then go to the next dealership and yada, yada. How, how can we create a long-term business out of this? And so they, they, they realized that the real opportunity was to be the marketplace. Um, so today we have like true car and the other ones. Um, they were the pioneers in that. Um, they, they basically created the marketplace, identifying people that were searching for new and used cars and then these dealerships that they had made websites for were their partners, right? So they signed them up to each dealership was signed up to a territory. Um, and that territory consisted of, you know, at that time, I think it was like a geographic center based on a zip code and a radius outside that zip code. So you just imagine these circles around these dealerships and brands. So the brands would be the car makes. So if you were, if Safe was a Mercedes dealership in San Jose and Raj, you had a um, BMW dealership in San Jose, you guys would, Raj would say, I want every lead that you guys get within 20 miles of me. Safe would say, oh, I'm a little bit more conservative. I want five miles. And, and basically you would have a pre-negotiated deal to buy those leads that AutoWeb sent you for those. Mm -hmm. So it was, it was really cool because, um, it opened up my eyes to um, what new business models and opportunities were being enabled just by the digitization of commerce, 
and and society, right? Now we were seeing the physical dealerships being replicated in this digital world, right? So as a consumer, I was shopping for a car, I'd land on AutoWeb, I'd put in what I'm looking for. And based on my zip code and certain deals that I'd supply, I'd hit send and AutoWeb would send that to Raj if you know I was looking for a BMW and I fell within his territory. And then Raj would have to, would be responsible for trying to sell him a car, sell me a car. That's it. Um, what was interesting is uh, I was in there and then um, a good friend of mine um, also joined the team and, and we were just learning. So I'll tell you a funny story about like how, how um, things can open your eyes when you're just exposed to, to new industries and new models. So while I was at that company, there was, there was a competitor. Um, There's several competitors in that space, right? One of the competitors was a company called Auto Mall USA. And they had a massive marketing budget. You would see commercials for automallusa.com on TV, right? Most companies couldn't afford to do that. We could we didn't have the budget. They were just pumping money. Why? They were just trying to get get leads because they already had you know they were pre-sold so they could they could bill that as revenue well we had a partnership with a small company a couple person operation that they had a ton of leads that they were getting we had a partnership to buy their leads that company solely existed because of an error auto mall usa did Auto Mall USA at the time was was marketing themselves as Auto Mall USA, spending a ton on marketing, but they didn't realize that most consumers, when they were seeing their marketing campaigns, so they saw the TV ad, the URL that they remembered was Auto Mall. They would forget the USA. So they'd go to automall.com and they'd go to something else. So some guy realized this and captured those leads, sold those leads back to us. <laughs> That's so, crazy. And then if, as long as we had a Delta to sell those leads to our network where it was profitable, it made sense, right? Cause it didn't cost us what, what Automall USA was doing. Um, so we were just seeing all these different kind of things happening. And it was truly, truly the kind of the wild, wild West era of, of the dot com when you think of dot com and, and all that and, and i see similarities to it with with the world of crypto in the last in the last several years the reason i share that story is that's just one example of the different things that we were seeing with these this early 2000s or are we still in the this is 99 90s? this is wow. this is like this is like mid 99 okay. so um my friend and i were like man this is we got to come up with some kind there's there's so many there's got to be so many different ways to create value for consumers and connect businesses and industries. And we were just seeing so many different, different opportunities. Um, and then we just, we were just brainstorming one day and Netflix at the time had started. So again, Bay area guys, all this stuff is happening in our backyards. I grew up in Cupertino. I was working at auto web in Santa Clara, you know, about like 10 minutes away. Netflix was founded in, in Las Gatas, just five minutes away from, <laughs> from where I live. And at the time, Netflix was delivery of, of DVDs. You guys remember, right? It was a mail or it's a, it was a marketplace for mail order movie watching. You'd, you'd request your DVDs. They'd ship it to you. You'd watch it and you ship it back. That's all it was. And streaming hadn't caught up, right? The technology wasn't there yet. And so we were sitting there one day. And we go, wow, what's another industry that is still very physical and logistically um, intensive? And neither my friend or I are, are photographers or anything like that. And all of a sudden, just we're like, what about photography? You know, most people are taking pictures. And then how are they getting their pictures developed? Because digital cameras at that time, 
were like, at best, they estimated maybe 10% of the market, right? So most people were walking around with traditional cameras or those disposables, if you guys can remember those. Yeah. <laughs> so what do you do when you're done with your roll of film? You, at the time, would either go to a grocery store or a department store or a drugstore, drop it off and pick it up the next time you were there. Um, or you had these independent photo shops. And the model was interesting because the grocery stores weren't know, known for their quality. They were known for their convenience. You were going to the grocery store twice a week, no matter what. You run out of milk, you run out of items, right? So you go there, so you drop off your film this time. Later in the week or next week when you're back there, you pick it up. You pick up your prints and you pay for it. The independent photo shops existed because they were the quality providers. They would actually provide better prints, higher quality. And so... Um, we thought that, wait a second, why don't we just take the Netflix and things we know from AutoWeb and create a marketplace so that people can um, order their photo finishing services online? And based on their zip code, this is where the, the AutoWeb thing came in, is based on their zip code, if we would sign up independent photo finishers, we would identify the closest photo finisher to that consumer, then the consumer would place their order online. The order electronically goes to the photo finisher. The consumer mails in these envelopes that we provided for free, mails their traditional rolls of film to, to, the, to the shop. The shop gets it right away, turns it around, sends it back. So they could turn it around quicker and better quality and a lower price than, than even the, the grocery store. Because where the Photoshop's had a challenge was they had the equipment to process a lot of prints, but how do they get the consumers? Yeah. We would send them that. So um, that's what we did. Um, so that was my first um, real, I call it tech. It's pretty low tech, but I mean, it's, it's a marketplace and you see things like that even today with, with direct to consumer marketplaces. So we, we launched that. We launched it nationwide. We raised very little friends and family money. And that was another lesson that I learned is, is timing can be everything. So we launched that in early of 2000. And if you remember what happened in early of 2000, everything crashed, right? So um, when we were ready to go and try to raise money to grow this thing, um, we just fell on deaf ears. And it just, we just didn't have any luck. Luckily, we didn't, we structured the business where we didn't have high operating expenses. So we kept it going for a couple of years and ultimately we shut it down. It just wasn't enough to, um, enough traction or growth to, to be significant for us. Um, but it was a great learning ex uh, experience, you know, and, and I remember one call with a, with an investor and this was probably in like March, April of 2000. <laughs> And the guy said, wow, you know, if you guys would have called me six months earlier, I would write you a check right now for what you guys are doing. It goes, but right now it's over. He goes, we're, we're not doing anything. And so he learned those things. And, you know, you can you can do everything perfectly. And and in the end, a lot of things have to align. And a lot of times that's that's luck. Um, so that that was a great experience. Um, and then then I then I joined a private corporation, um, kind of as a business strategist advisor. Um, it was a family owned corporation, but, and, and I joined the team to help, um, restructure, organize and grow. They had a bunch of different businesses in different industries. Um, but initially joined to help restructure and grow the retail operations. And it was shortly after that, I, I started there that, um, the CEO, um, of the company, um, so kind of like the patriarch of the family, it's a private organization, um, said, hey, I need your help in a ton of things. We, we have our hands in a bunch of different stuff. And so I was just getting exposed to all kinds of stuff, um, naturally again, because it was based in Silicon Valley. One of the things that they were doing was investing in, in tech startups. And that's how, that's how I got exposed, my initial exposure to the investment world of early stage tech. This is again that like works. mid 2000s that were, were that problem. This 
not even. This is starting in 2001. And so <laughs> this is the early days and, and got involved with that. And then just really enjoyed that because I, I like, I like helping people um, no matter what it is. And I think that's the thing that was most attractive to me about being involved on the investment side of startups um, because you get a chance to try and help and support those startups and those founders. And it's not easy what they're doing. Um, they're sacrificing everything and a lot in the hopes that it, it will turn into what they're envisioning. And even if it doesn't, doesn't mean they were wrong. Again, it goes back to a lot of things have to align for something to be successful, you know, and it's not, it's not as easy as sometimes we see from the consumer perspective, when we see the end result, we don't, we don't know, or we weren't really exposed to all that they went through all the challenges. And so that got me really excited. So I was, I was up there in the Bay area until about 2000, I think it was seven. And, um, I decided, you know, I, I like Southern California. I've always liked Southern California. I, I want to move down, down there. And I, I decided to do that, moved down here and got involved with um, a lot of commercial real estate development. And um, this is, again, working for the same organization. Um, they, they have quite an extensive real estate portfolio. Um, and they had a, a large property, I think at the time valued at around it, somewhere around $80 million. So this is around 16 years ago. Um, and they were converting, it was an office building. They were converting it to a, to condominiums to sell. And this is, here's another example of how you can have the right strategy and timing just doesn't work out. Right. And so this is late in construction. And, and again, the CEO comes up to me and says, Hey, I need your help. And I said, well, what's up? And he goes, Oh, we got this real estate asset. We're going to sell as condos. I want to sell as condos. I'm like, you don't want to sell as condos it's kind of <laughs> late in construction to make that decision. Why are you, why are you doing that? And he goes, ah, you know, we own a lot of real estate. We don't like to sell. We like to hold long-term. And so I go, well, okay, that still doesn't make sense because if you like to hold long-term, that wasn't the plan for this. What's really going on? He said, we can't sell it if we want to. The market is starting to turn ar around in the direction we don't want it to go we're stuck and we need to come up with a new model. And um, that was a project I was given. I wasn't a real estate guy, um, but I was trying the task I was given was let's figure out how we can reposition this and, and hold on to the property long-term generate revenue out of it, grow it. Um, long story short, um, I did some research in a few different sectors and I, identified at the time, it'll make a lot more sense now because of our experience with COVID and the evolution of working from home and remote and all that. But this is in 2007. Um, so it's before we all had that. Um, what I discovered is there was a, an opportunity to help create what I called a lifestyle solution um, that was designed more for professionals and entrepreneurs and startups. And the reason I call it a lifestyle solution is because I couldn't come up with another term, right? <laughs> but what I, what I meant by a lifestyle solution is we needed entrepreneurs and professionals, people that are career oriented, and that's the biggest component to their everyday life. Um, right now, they have to have a place to live. Again, this is going 15, 16 years ago. They have to have a separate place to work from. Right. And then they also have to have leisure stuff. Right. And up until that point, all three of those were in three different solutions. Right. You'd have to rent an apartment, furnish it, do all that. You'd have to go get an executive suite office space or virtual offices existed. A lot of people would meet in Starbucks. Right. Because they couldn't afford to do both. Um, and even then you didn't have all your leisure amenities there. So basically what I pitched is why don't we take all three of these models and build it all under one roof in Southern California, in Southern California. So we, the concept got approved, um, by the owners. Um, we built that out as a, um, turnkey and lifestyle solution, a place where these entrepreneurs and professionals could literally walk in 
renting a unit um, on any lease term that they wanted, whether it was month to month or a year or anything in between, because that's one of the challenges entrepreneurs and startups have is inherently because of what they're the endeavor they've they've decided to take on. There is so much unknown. They don't know if they're going to be around in three months. They don't know what's going to happen, right? There's so much uncertainty with running a startup or being an entrepreneur, right? So how can how can you expect every single entrepreneur to commit to a two-year office lease, right? Or even a year apartment lease. They don't know. They, they don't know. So why are you making it difficult for them? Let's just do it month to month. Let them do it whatever they're comfortable at. And also give them all the tools to do everything under one roof. Meaning from the moment they walk in, they walk into a furnished full service, all inclusive, meaning internet, utilities, everything is there. No accounts to manage or set up, activate. Yeah, none of that crap, right? They literally walk into a turn in, turnkey apartment with a laptop in their clothes. That's it. That's all they need. Yeah, they, they got to buy food and stock the fridge, but everything is already in there. So it's seamless. At the same time, within the property, incorporate all the amenities that they would need and expect from an office building, right? So they had the conference rooms, they had the meeting areas, they had events, they had all of that, all under one roof. They never leave. All of that is right there. And so what are they going to have in, access to in their in their um, free time is they want to have fun stuff, you know, the things that they they would find we used we resorts to kind of inspire what we would add for our leisure amenities. So basically we took three different real estate models. So furnished turnkey all-inclusive apartments, combine that with everything you would come to expect of an executive suite office building combined with the leisure amenities of a resort hotel, we like intertwine them all into this one, one model. And um, we launched with that and, and it kicked ass. It kicked ass. It was, it, um, I think a year or so after we launched the value of that property went from it being 80 million to about $150 million. Um, today, um, I would estimate that that, brand um, has in excess of $500 million of real estate assets um, operating under that model. Um, so that was really fun um, to do that. And again, it was, it was learning the needs of these entrepreneurs and startups and how that translates to the real estate world and creating a solution for them. Um, and now you're seeing different kinds of um, variations off that um, throughout the market. By the time we did it, not in California, not in the U S no, nobody had, had that model, um, but we ran with and, it. And and we're not mentioning the name, but it's a very very famous like startup office like office based real estate kind of uh, uh, community. Yeah. So um, when I tell people that story, they think that that I made made out like a that I consider that my biggest exit. Um, but full disclosure, I had I had zero equity in it. So that's 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 a learning lesson maybe we can share with with founders and entrepreneurs. Um, I went on trust of um, the the team, and I was told, oh yeah, we're going to do this. You're going to have a part of this. We're going to grow it. Blah blah blah. Um, but I I got nothing for it. So um, other than the story to share, um, and I and I still consider it a success. Um, but financially, did it, did it give me anything? No zero dollars and so um that's that's kind of part of the experiences of being an entrepreneur and doing things like that right you can do everything and and you can have successes does it always mean there is a positive outcome for you no but you can still learn a ton from it um so you know protecting your interests is something um that's important for entrepreneurs i think to to learn um but meanwhile so and then how this kind of Goes. I love the energy. She's yeah, so that that led to you know the success of that property. Um, just led to me kind of getting more and more exposed to the Los Angeles um, community, and I had no idea Los Angeles had such tremendous potential to be a tech ecosystem. 
I had no clue. I didn't move down to LA because of um, tech. I moved down here because it was warmer. Um, and so I started noticing some things in LA that reminded me a lot about what I saw and experienced not only as a kid, but earlier in my career in Silicon Valley. And I'm like, and I don't think I would have picked up on it had I not lived in Silicon Valley for so long, right? So I'm I'm picking up on these things that remind me of, of wait a second, what's going on here? And I start digging because for me, if somebody would ask me 15, 20 years ago what I thought LA was, oh, that's where media, Hollywood, entertainment is. Yes, it is. But it's so much more than that. And so I just started entrenching myself in the community. And um, it reminded me of the earlier days of Silicon Valley that I saw. And I'm like, oh my God, what's going on here? And the more and more I dug and peeled back the layers of what makes up LA, the more I became convinced that we're about to see another Silicon Valley blow up. And I've seen this movie before. I know, I know what it takes. And so <laughs> having been on the... Um, investment side of of tech i was really curious to see what the investment infrastructure of a newer emerging ecosystem was was developing and who the key players were and with my background um i was able to establish those relationships fairly quickly and so i just started going and and meeting and figuring out who were going to be so, you know, you mentioned in Silicon Valley, you mentioned Sequoia, you mentioned Kleiner Perkins, you mentioned all these guys, right? Everybody knows of them, right? I was looking for who are going to be the Sequoias and the KPs of this region, but they're just young right now. They're just new. And um, I started building, building those relationships. And these were guys that were super, super experienced. All-stars, if you would have picked them up and placed them in Silicon Valley, you would have said, yeah, yeah, this is, this is who it is. They just happened to be in a region that was on the early stage of its development as far as a tech ecosystem, but I knew what to look for. Right. And so I started establishing relationships with these guys and these guys were starting funds. I think the smallest one was around $4 million. Right. But you knew based on their backgrounds and what they were doing that they're not going to stay in a $4 million fund. This is just how they're starting. They are a startup themselves. And so my next thing was, well, I want to support their growth. I think, I think one of the mistakes um, that we do in um, the tech and investment world, we give a lot of focus and too much focus to the startups that become successful and we need to focus a little bit more on the vcs the early early stage vcs that identify and support those startups at the very beginning they are such a critical component and i learned that being up in silicon valley through investments we made and so um anyways just built relationships with those guys help them raise money um through my network um and saw them grow. And so um, I, for a long time, I was just going out there educating people on what's going on in LA. Um, and it was really surprising to me that, um, I guess surprising and not surprising because most people when I talk to about LA as being a tech ecosystem with a ton of potential, they would say like, LA? No. You know, and then I'd, I'd have to throw a couple of facts out there and it would shock them, just like I got shocked when I started figuring out those things, right? So, you know, if I, if I ask you which, which U.S. metro region graduates the most engineers from top tier schools, right, in the U.S., most people would say two places, right? They would say Boston and Silicon Valley. Those, those would have been my two top picks. No, it's LA. It's been LA for a long, long time. It's been LA. But those engineers who are graduating, going to these other regions. And then if I ask you another question, like who, 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 which region employs the most tech jobs, right? Right away, I would say Silicon Valley. And nope, it's LA. <laughs> so 
So then you look at like the diversity of industry, the diversity of society and all these things, all the, the ingredients that you need for a tech ecosystem. You're like, oh my God, LA is amazing. And it's it even beats Silicon Valley one-to-one -one on all those categories. The only difference is Silicon Valley is a tech ecosystem started 50, 60 years ago. LA is newer. So it's it's got a ways to go to catch up. So, so a quick question. Yeah. Um, yeah, sorry, or, yeah, yeah, jump in, uh, jump in. You know, so I, I think we briefly kind of like skimmed over this, but so that previous community that you were a part of, like, which is yeah. a huge startup, like ecosystem now. Yeah. While you were there, how many startups that were actually a part of that ecosystem? Like, uh, I, I feel like that's a big point. Uh, we all should that make. That is a big point. Um, So the when you're saying the community are you talking about the one in la uh for both because you were you were involved in the one that started in uh, correct in silicon valley as well correct so um what i always found is that there is there is a combination right so that you had if you were to identify the community there was the bigger opportunity was the extended community that was um connected through different events, right? And at any given time, within any one of those communities, you could find, depending on the season, depending on how the economy is, you could you could find anywhere from around 100 startups, maybe less. Sometimes it could go up and upwards into the, the two or 300s, right? How people looked at and defined the startups I'm not sure, but I think what gave the the expansion of that was through the events, because that's when when you really saw the networking impact and the ability to tap into more and more communities. Um, we're still like so. This particular story is so mid maybe two thousands or early two thousands, yeah. and yeah. when startup ecos like incubators and accelerators were non-existent they were mainly professional they were starting to networks, pop up you know yeah, and, they were but, starting but to they pop were up. all old organizations they were old organizations. very few uh, that were catered to you know just like people that look like us to show up and be like hey i'm i'm trying something or or trying this yeah thing. yeah so and and then it's interesting that you brought up incubators and accelerators um i think a lot of different organizations were using those two terms just as a marketing ploy they weren't they weren't necessarily doing anything different to call themselves an incubator or, or an accelerator that just became the the buzzword uh, i i was guilty of that too at the time <laughs> i mean i mean everybody was trying to figure it out but i there there were some that were really doing it and there were some that, you know, they just said, okay, this is what everybody's calling this now. So this is what we are. Um, you know, I, I, to me, I've always defined those two terms differently. So to me, an accelerator is an organization that helps outside entities grow, right? But an incubator, I always felt was something that was a new organization, product, or company whose inception was developed internally to grow. I think that, and I think there is a difference to that, right? Um, I and and does it matter? Some of it is some semantics, but but some of it does does matter. And sorry, I think Gardner's just arrived. So so if it's if you hear buzzing, that's we what can't it, hear it. Yeah. Okay. Um, but we we started seeing a lot of incubators and accelerators grow um and you it was really interesting um because i i think that the most important thing is when it comes to founders and startups for them um they want to align themselves with partners and partners could be investors incubators, accelerators, whatever, whatever it may be, they want to, they want to align themselves with partners that have their best interests in mind. Um, and I, and I've seen the world where they don't, right. I've seen both sides. Um, I've seen, I've seen 
entrepreneurs come up to me, tell me about their company and it sounds exciting. As soon as I find out a certain name is a backer of their company, I want nothing to do with that company. Because although they believe that person or that entity has their best interest in mind, I know how there might be a different agenda behind why they're involved with the company. Um, and it's, and it's hard. It's something, it's something for startups that they have to learn that. And unfortunately, sometimes the only way they can learn is, is just through the experience of, of the negative experience. You know, that's, 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 that's a tough thing because startups, startups need money, right? They need to survive. Um, like you guys know the term smart money, right? You want it. If you had your choice, if you're doing a new company and you're raising money, if you had your choice of who you can get to invest in it, you always want the smart money, right? The, the investor that brings more than just the dollars. But when you're a startup, you're also tr just trying to survive. If somebody throws you out a life vest, <laughs> you're not, you're gonna, you're gonna come John. Um, but, I, but I've, but I've seen the negative side of that too. Um, so my advice to startups on that is 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 do your homework on who you're raising capital from. I get it. If you need the money to survive, just to keep your head above water, you, you may have no choice. But if you can figure out a way to survive without taking that, I don't want to call it dumb money, but it's negative money. Um, pass on it and try to try to get the right investor um, behind you. And Ali, if, if possible, I, a clarifying question there, because I think that's so appropriate for a, a lot of people. A lot yeah. of people are like, I need something. Yeah. And I don't want to derail too much, but what are the horror stories? Not horror stories. Like, what are we missing? So some young founders have never raised before. They're like, great. You know, this VC wants X, Y, and Z. And these terms are great. They're, what what terms mean? Like, okay. Mm -hmm. Like, Hey, listen, now I'm, the board is pushing me out of my own company. How'd that happen? Oh, this, you know, they get pro rata oh, shares, yeah. there's dilution, all the things like, so, you know, is there any, and I, I'm sure it's, it's bespoke to every contract and every VC, but are there yeah. some top level Red stuff? Flags. Like, hey, yeah, <laughs> no, truly, truly. Red flags. Hey, we need, we're the, we're not the lead, but we need a board seat or, you know, I don't know, something that I might be, yeah, I'll, I'll, you know, I'm an I'll a naive take to it. Yeah. Um, so, Red flags for me that I've seen in experience, right? Um, a red flag is somebody, oh, so just how we talked about the term incubator and accelerator was kind of just used as marketing. People claim that they're VCs when they're not, right? Um, a v when you claim you're a VC, that implies you have a fund. Right now, if you have a fund, generally it's not just one LP. Most people aren't their own LP and running a VC fund that that wouldn't quite fit the term, right? You generally have other people you raise capital from. Those are your LPs. That money goes into a pooled big fund. And then you have the general partner who's managing the investment activity and, the, and everything behind it. Make sure they have a fund. I, I kid you not, I know people that go around saying, I'm a managing director of this fund. Uh, there is no fucking fund, right? There, it, do, do, do some basic homework. You can figure it out. And, and, and there are notable people out there doing this. Um, I don't know how they get away with it, um, to be honest with you, but I mean, they're, they're, they're doing it. And then another red flag. The person who claims to be a potential investor, are they, what is their investment activity like when they claim everything? Is it all over the board? Do they sound like they've been in everything? Probably a red flag, <laughs> right? Um, here, here's another one. Are they that same person that claims to be this great investor, right? Are they are they trying to wow you with all the things that they have? Right? That's a big red flag. Big red flag. You know, they're and I tell you why they do that. 
they do that because human nature, when we when we see tangible things that are signs of wealth, we are dispositioned to assume that the wealthy individuals have our best interest in mind. And, and know what they're doing and know what exactly, they're doing. Exactly. And that is not necessarily the case. Why are they trying to sell you on all this stuff that they have? Shouldn't they be interested in about your company more? It, right? It, it gets to me, Ali. It Dude, gets I have so me. many examples, so many examples. Good VCs, they tell you whether they're interested and whether they're not interested pretty quickly. You know the guys that are trying to scam you? They drag you along. Any ideas why they would drag you along? Raj, you're an entrepreneur. You don't, you don't have any success yet, but you're working on something you're really passionate about. You've sacrificed everything. You're trying to do this. You don't have a regular day job. You're, you're focused 100%. You and your team focused on this new thing. And you've, you've met this VC and they're just dragging you along. They're not giving you a yes or no. What is that doing to Raj? Putting it's a noose wasting my time and energy. Yeah. You got my it. Runway's and it's put on now. Your runway is gone. Guess what? Now maybe I can take more from Raj. These are the games they play. These are the this games. Is... It's it's crazy. I've seen it all. I've seen it all. Wow. It all. Especially the I've, ones already I've... priced out. Like uh... yeah. Right. Yeah. And and so it 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 gets me really like I I want to punch somebody when I start even just thinking about these things, because I've seen it happen to people. I've seen it happen to people and um, it's tough. It's tough. And, and how do you, how do you, um, I, I think our entrepreneurs and our startups are such an important component of our society and of our economy. Anybody that doesn't understand that has no clue what they're talking about. They're so important for, for our economy and our society. Yet they also tend to be the most vulnerable, right? Because they've sacrificed everything. They're trying to create something massive, right? They're, nobody's trying to create just another little thing. Everybody has this. And so they become vulnerable. And there are a lot of parties out there that are just set up to looking to take advantage of these. And so... Um, those, those are kinds of things that you can, you can figure out. I, I remember finding out about, um, sometimes you find out indirectly, like I, I had met a guy and he was a serial entrepreneur. So it wasn't his first go around. It was, it wasn't his first go around. He had exited, I think at that time, two or three companies. And he reached out to me and he said, Hey, Ali. Um, I had a meeting with, with this group and do you know of them? I'm like, yeah, I know that group. What happened? And he goes, they didn't quite say no, but they're asking for a lot of different things. And the individuals in there are asking for individual things. And I, I knew exactly, exactly what they were doing. They were, they were trying to get free equity from the guy. They were trying to get free equity from the guy and and lock him up. And I told him, "Change for brand recognition." Huh? Yeah, yeah, it's it's dangling this carrot out in front of him. And so, and I and I told the guy, and I said, "Look, I will never tell you how to run your business, but I will tell you do what you think is the smartest thing for your business. Would you give up pieces of your business for nothing?" And he goes, "I got you, Ali," <laughs> and and he knew. You know, and so um, it's un it's unfortunate because I feel that it's so hard and the odds are so low for startups and founders to hit success, right? No matter what, if they do everything perfectly, if they get the right investors, all the right part, it's still everything has to align, right, for, for success to happen. How many potential successful startups were screwed because they got the wrong players? They were exposed to the long, wrong players at the beginning. That's what makes me mad. Yeah. That's 
what really makes me angry is because I've seen that. Like, and they could have been monsters. Even if they weren't monsters, they could have yeah. had a fair chance to try. But they didn't even have a fair chance because the certain entity or people that got in from the beginning, <laughs> they, that wasn't their goal. Yeah, that they was knew. Cool. They, yeah. And so that's 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 something that I think, um, and it's hard for for startups and founders to really understand because until you go through the experience, you can't even imagine. I like here's something that'll blow your mind. We talk about good investors and bad investors, right? Bad investors have a different agenda, different intentions. Are I've seen bad investors ruin companies that they have put their own money into. <laughs> right? Like say that again. Like say it doesn't it again. even make sense. It doesn't, it doesn't even make sense. Like the math and like one plus one is hippopotamus. I'm like, Ali, I feel like there's something wrong here. Yeah. So so if someone puts money into a company, right? You would assume they're doing that. Because they believe in the company and they believe in the future value growing. You don't put money into any, the whole idea of any kind of investment, no matter what it is, is the money you're putting today, you hope becomes more than that <laughs> at some point in the future, right? You're not putting it in today because you want it to become less. I have seen instances where people that put in money into a company are making money a different way. So the success of that company doesn't even matter. They just needed to have a piece because they were going to take that claim to do something else with that entity. Who cares what happens with this company? It It is crazy. It is crazy. That's why you have to, as a startup, as a founder, align yourself with the right investors, but again, if you can, right? And and I've I get it, you have to survive, but find out a way to survive without getting the negative. It's like, do you want a negative employee? Do you want a negative co-founder? Do you you don't want those in your organization because they they're toxic, right? Just because someone has money or claims to have money, don't don't let them in because you don't want toxic money in your organization either. It, it, it's, it's disastrous and it can be. So, um, I mean, that, I'm so glad we were talking on this, on this topic. Cause I've, I've seen that. Um, and I've, it's not just like a one-off for, you know, a couple of times I've seen that, Oh, wow. This is a pattern here that I'm seeing. This is why they're doing this. There's a whole nother agenda. They don't, they don't, they need the startup and the entrepreneurs, but their interests aren't aligned. The startup and the entrepreneur are trying to grow the company. This guy or this group wants this company for something totally different. And those don't match. Right. And I've, and I've seen startups completely crash because of that. It's crazy. It's crazy. No, thank you. Thank you very much for sharing. I think that was that was a really cool piece of advice that we didn't really expect to really dive into for this episode. But it nobody thinks helpful. that exists out there. Nobody right? thinks it yeah. exists. Yeah, it's all. It's it does. all. I'm telling you, it does. Yeah. <laughs> um, no, but so I mean, you're actually yeah. First time founder, you get a term sheet. You, you're 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 already celebrating. You, you're you're, you're celebrating, celebrating, right? Yeah, that's it. You're celebrating. You're just you, grateful you that somebody you believing signed, in you. Yeah, you don't even read it. You sign that shit. Yeah, we, we've heard the term shook hands with the devil, right? Yeah. There's a reason that term exists. Nobody thinks knowingly they did that, right? Uh, and and, and so crazy. for our viewers too, like, so most of our audience, uh, we believe is on the earlier stage side, like pre seed yeah. to, let's say, series A. That's where it happens the most. <laughs> That's where it happens the most. <laughs> why? Because they're the most vulnerable again, right? That's why... I mean, if you look at, don't even look at investing, just look at how laws and everything are set up just for society. We generally want to protect our most vulnerable. Why are 
Why, why do we have more laws and stuff around our kids and things like that? Because they're vulnerable. They're more vulnerable than an adult. The adult should have the knowledge, experience, everything to protect themselves a little bit better. Investing is like that too. When you look at how the laws of accredited investors and all that work, it's the same thing. You got to protect those who are vulnerable. Nobody protects the, the entrepreneurs and the startups. That's wild, Ali. Yeah. That is wild. No, it's fucked up. It's fucked up. <laughs> you can't, you can't smoke till you're 18 because you're an idiot. You don't know. You have 18 years. Not 18 years. Yes, to weeks figure it out. Your startup. You got it. You got There's it. There's got to be something in there. Interesting. There, there, there has to be something in there, but it's just, it's. Yeah. It's you know what's hard, fucked up? Man. They'll, they'll protect the accredited investor, even though they're sophisticated. Yep. They're sophisticated. They're accredited. They have their million. Don't million. don't let me don't let me get into the accredited investor side. Nope. So, nope. <laughs> so do, most people don't even know how the accredited investor laws work, right? So um, the whole reason why we have sorry, Seth. Seth's like, Ross, shut the fuck up. Yeah, no, yeah. Well, this is awesome. No, I mean the whole reason why we have laws that around accredited investors is because. It's a very simple concept. The person that meets a certain wealth criteria has either one or the other or both things. They have the experience to evaluate their own investments, right? So that they, their wealth should dictate that they have enough experience to make these decisions. Two, if they don't have the experience, they have enough capital to go hire someone that does. So that way, they they are equipped with enough tools to protect themselves to make investment decisions. That's why credit investors laws exists. Is it is it completely correct the way it's set up? I don't think so. I don't, I don't think so. We we can we can do some things to improve the accredited investor definition. Um, all three of us are in California, right? Uh, Seattle. Rogers in Seattle. You're in Seattle. Okay, close enough. Yeah, um, same shit. California, California. Um, okay, going back to the credit investor law. One way that you people in the U.S. are allowed are qualified as an accredited investor is based on net worth, right? The assets you own. But guess what? You can't include equity in your primary residence in that definition. Or in that formula. In California, yeah. it, most people, if you if you are able to purchase a home, that's a pretty significant feat in California, right? Because real estate is so expensive. Yet you can't count the equity you have in it. So now all of a sudden you have all this equity in your home, but you're blocked out from making investments because you don't meet the credit investor criteria. So you lose an opportunity. I think we have to do something. I would like to see more being done to help unlock um, that untapped power um, of investment for, for those in credit investors, you know? Yeah, no, that's, that's surprising. Um, I, I, I've, I've never really thought about it that way either. Like yeah. protections for the founders and for the, but yeah, I think, I think found, I, there has to be something for these founders. There has to be something for these founders. I don't know what it is, but they're kind of left up to figure it out. They're kind of left up to like, and they're in a place where they're, they're trying to just get money to keep things going, right? Yeah. Who protects them? I don't know. What are they going to do? Go sue? Which lawyer is going to start doing that for free? And they, how they're going to pay for it? Yeah, they're, they're just, you just got to hope that they <laughs> that they pick the right the right partners and everything. So- it's it's really tough. It's really tough. And especially if, if 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 I'm a I'm a founder and I'm going to angels right out the gate. Yeah, yeah. I haven't seen as as much happen on the angel side because um, generally what you see is when people raise money from angels, it, it really stays within their network of, of network. Fans. Yeah, and so there there is there's something to that. It's that it's that next next phase where um they're often susceptible yeah you know? and especially uh, with the proliferation of, of, of spvs and stuff like you're gonna get everybody under the sun coming into this shit now yeah yeah and and it's it's scary because 
imagine, imagine, I'll give you this scenario. Imagine, imagine you're a startup founder and you just raised a good amount of capital from, from this investor. You don't, you're assuming it's a good investor. That person has money in your company, right? They invested in your company. Are you going to give good weight to things they suggest you to do? Probably, <laughs> right? They have money in your company. They should have your best interest in mind. And you also kind of at that stage are looking for the value. <laughs> exactly. You're 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 just trying, right? And and so you have no idea what their intentions may be. You know, and so it's it's and I've seen a lot of that. I've I've seen and it's unfortunate. And I've I've been in a position where again, like the example I gave you, where my friend said, Hey Ali, do you know these guys? And I'm like, eh, look at it this way. Well. Um, I've I've seen others that have gone um and and they just they they typically choose the money, right? Because they need it. And the only good thing out of that is is the lesson maybe that gets learned right yeah. i think that's 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 so far the only protection we have is if enough go through and learn these lessons then maybe that kind of circulates in the one of them one of the uh so you know every every entrepreneur has that you know i got fucked over story right yeah and yeah every vc every ecosystem resource person you know yeah, every single person goes through that. And it's it's a very shitty thing to just accept. Yeah, people just kind of sweep it under the rug. So I'm, I'm yeah. glad that you're, you're highlighting that. Um, yeah, no, and that, I've had that, I've had entrepreneurs come back to me years later, and and they said, "Hey, Ali, you know, just wanted to thank you. You were the only guy that told it to us straight. Yeah. They ended up getting screwed, right? But at least they understood it, right? So that that was value, and and. I think somebody that has that on their next attempt, they're just that much stronger. Yeah. So it's, that's, it's interesting. It's an interesting world. It's an interesting world, but do not get me wrong. The good VCs that are out there are awesome. The good investors are awesome. Mm -hmm. And there's plenty out there. There's plenty out there. Amazing. Well, let's switch uh, gears a little because I want to... Sure. Um, you know, we, so my estimate uh, of the number of startups that have gone through communities or, you know, or the support networks that where you have been directly involved, number in the hundreds, right? And and yeah. I'm not talking yeah. about like small companies. I'm talking about companies that actually went out, there were quite a few uh, exits in there. Um, yeah. And you know, the people who were there know you. Um, you know, without, with or without the recognition, but like, talk just a little more about how you enjoy working with, with founders, like, because it, it's clear that you do, you've given so much to be able to be close to those, uh, those kinds of people, but how, what, like today, what do you do? And, um, you know, what kind of startups and founders would you like to, to work with? I, I like working with startups. Um, I love, I love learning. Um, and, not only what they're doing, but the sector that they're in and their business and, and helping them. I'm a strategist at heart. Right. And I like not to see my ideas um, implemented that that's, that's not a big deal for me. I just like to be able to contribute to some of the brainstorming and open up thinking, you know, there was a, there was a startup, um, that we were looking at, that I was looking at um, a couple of years ago now, um, involved in the in the IVF space, um, and there's there's a lot of activity in in that sector. I don't know much about it, um, but I know the problem is that it's a very costly procedure for the consumer. And the conversion rate isn't compatible with the costs, right? So it's, there's a lot of costs and risk. And they had developed a new technology. Um, and it could help better predict the outcomes, increase the 
fertility rate, and also it would, it would it was less intrusive and, and thus lower cost, right? And they came up with a, a really cool model, but um, they wanted to just go in and, and capture the market um, at a lower price. And I said, that's cool. Um, but do you think you have to drop your price? You know, why don't you just change how you bill? And maybe you can position your, your solution um, with a guarantee in it, right? It still costs this, but we guarantee this result or this percentage and only bill if you get that. Because ultimately people people are willing to pay the higher price. It's the it's the pro procedure converting and actually being successful that's the challenge. So um that just just sharing that with them that you know here's a different way to look at it. Um sometimes um you know I I just I like more on the on the strategy side and helping helping open a bias and we all get like that, right? We all, whenever we're in something, we're so focused um, that sometimes we, it's hard to see some some things on the side, and and um, that could be operationally, that could be different parts of the the product mix, and and just how the company is structured. Many business models are actually even coherently the same, or yeah, from the same branches. So, in somebody like you, who's seen so many and been intimately involved with the founders as they were figuring shit out yeah being able to find uh new branches or new kind of ways of doing things is, is super valuable oh yeah oh yeah i mean you can you can take the big razor model right <laughs> another example I, I like to use is baking soda baking soda figured out how to get in so many different products and nobody knows what it's in there for but we all oh yeah great it's got baking soda so I mean, there's there's so many different things that you can you can do. There's different there's different business models, but you're you're absolutely right. They you, you can find a lot of analogies um, between industries, between sectors, and it's just different ways and different approaches. Um, and just share, just share like, hey, this kind of work doesn't mean it's going to work, but maybe there's something in there that we can look at um, and borrow from and and deploy to to this product or this service, you know. Absolutely. Do you, do you enjoy like um, working within certain kinds of sectors or industries or is it pretty agnostic? You know, I think it, I think we all like things that are easy to understand. You know, um, when, when you can't understand a company or the product or service that they're trying to deliver, it, it's you got to just kind of just say you got to be okay with saying like this is too much for me this is i don't understand this space mm -hmm. right um but things that seem easy to understand um doesn't necessarily mean they're they're non-technical um but you have to you have to feel a comfort level and and you kind of sense that based on experience like you mentioned sometimes in identical or similar industries or sometimes from different industries, but you see how the there's, there's similarities. Um, and, I, and I think you pick those up right away when you're, when you meet a founder or, a, or you're presented with, with a, a new company or you review a deck, you know, some decks you just go, Oh, that resonates so well, never knew of this, never, but it makes sense to you. I think yeah. you, you kind of figure that out um, as you go through it. So what kind of like stages then like so we you know mo most of mine and Raj's experiences like let's say priest he was a um yeah. but you've been been around the block but some people prefer working with very early stage like napkin founders on the pre-seed side or some who have a certain amount of funding or a certain amount of arr uh which do you like um i don't i don't i don't know i, I have a lot of experience working with the earlier companies because i think they need you generally have more experience working with them because they're the one that ones that typically don't have the resources to do it on their own. They're always looking for help. So you get exposed to a lot more. I remember this is this is a funny story. This is, goes back to again 99 at AutoWeb. So that was the the marketplace for uh, leads for car dealerships, right? So how were our contracts done with with car dealerships? 
if Raj had the BMW dealership at, you know, zip code XYZ at in San Jose and he bought a, you know, 20 mile radius of any BMW leads, part of my contract with Raj was that if any leads for BMW fit came to that territory, I could not sell it to more than two dealerships, including Raj, right? So Raj would, they had exclusivity to a degree, right? Every territory was exclusive to no more than two brand, two, two makes of that, right? Because you, it wouldn't be fair. I can't, it wouldn't make sense to bill 10 different BMW dealerships for one customer, but two they were okay with because they knew they had to compete. And so um, the CEO um, was always looking at ways to generate more revenue. So again, this goes back almost 25 years ago. It was 1999. He was looking at more ways to generate more revenue, right? And, and AutoWeb had, a, had an inherent problem by selling these circles of territory, right? What if Ali, the customer, came and looked for a BMW and I entered my physical location and I fell at 20.1 miles outside of Raj's territory and AutoWeb didn't have that zip code covered by another BMW dealer. What is that for AutoWeb? Zero dollars in revenue, right? Lost, lost revenue. I, we marketed, we got Ali, got Ali to fill in the form. He hit submit. We don't have anybody to, to, to bill. So that was a big challenge that they had is how could they they capture more revenue because it's hard. To, how do I convince Raj to get a bigger territory? I mean, he's like, how far do I have to go? It's harder to bring people in. They're going to go somewhere closer to him. So I was on the account management side and we knew that dealers had to convert a certain amount of their leads to be happy. And that's kind of why we had set up that you could not sell one lead to more than two dealers. So what I proposed is, well, we can kind of still sell that lead to someone else because if Ali's looking for a BMW and we've already sent it to two people, what are BMW's competitors? <laughs> Ladies, right? So, Ali submits to send his lead, goes to Raj and the other BMW dealership. On the screen, what pops up for Ali, we saw you you're, you are really interested in the BMW 7 Series. We thought you might also like the S Series from Mercedes. <laughs> nice. Click this button to send to these two dealerships. <laughs> now I just doubled the revenue that I got from Ali. That's smart. <laughs> Zero additional marketing cost, right? Yeah. And non-competing with Raj. Yeah. And guess what? If Raj being sophisticated and a professional understands that he's already competing with Mercedes anyways, it doesn't hurt him. Yeah. Chances are that BMW shopper is also looking at the Mercedes. Probably maybe a, a might be looking at a Porsche as well. Right. If they're looking for German cars in that case. So there's there's different ways to figure things out. And sometimes if you're in it, you, you don't see it. Uh, so finding strategic stuff I, I love and it can, can be in different industries. That's that's awesome. Um, and so next up would be more like. Which of the founders you prefer working with. So some of our, our kind of fractional executives or, or special yep. advisors, you know, they prefer either with the CEOs only or the C CTOs, the CMOs, the COOs. Is there anybody in particular that you kind of focus on? You know what? I I like the founders that um yeah, I'll give you an example. Um there's there's founders that understand that the business of their startup is greater than any one of the individual components, including themselves. 
right? And um, the reason I say that is, is those founders generally can um, navigate all the uncertainty that is around the life cycle of being a startup, right? If, if you talk to early stage VCs, when they say, yeah, you know, what do you, when you ask them, what do you look for? The most important thing they're looking for is the, is the team, you know, and you find really, really smart people, um, working and, and you, you find smart founders all the time. Um, but there are some that just you sense from them and you, and just in talking to them, you realize that they're going to do whatever it takes. They're going to figure it out. They're going to adapt. They're going to change. They're going to do all that. There are a lot that, um, you get the opposite where, um, you don't know if, if they can be that adaptable and, um, why I think that's important in an early stage company is chances are whatever you started the company as wherever you tried to do, you pursued this opportunity did each in a year, things are going to be different than what you thought, maybe even in six months, three months. Right. I mean, you have to give things time to evolve, but chances are where you start and where you end up are, and what you thought, was going to happen are, are a lot different. Um, I think the, the founders that are, um, more equipped to navigate like that are, are really, are really the most, the most promising ones. And that's why I say that you, you look at the, the VCs and you ask, you ask them, what's the most important thing you're looking for in a company, the early stage guys, they go team, team. You know, I mean, there's, there's, I would rather have a dynamite team and even an inferior technology, um, whatever this, whatever the, the product or service is, um, than a better technology, but maybe not the best team, you know, and, and even, and that, that even goes down to, um, teams and their history of working together and how well they work together. You'll, you'll see VCs ask that, oh, how long have you known each other? I've, you know, oh, we just met, we connected, we're doing this, this. That's risk for them, right? Yeah. Like, okay, are these guys going to be, these three guys, are they going to be compatible in a year? Are they going to be compatible in two years? And there's a lot of issues that can come up. Um, so, uh, you know, I, but if if there's a certain type of, I, don't, I wouldn't call it a certain type of founder. I, I I like to help where I can. Um, and I like to identify ways to, you know, share resources with them. Um, just from what I've been exposed to. Um, and, and that's it, you know, um, so Ali, uh, I'm, I'm sorry to have to cut not you too specific. Uh, off. Uh, so we unfortunately have to cut this episode a little short today because, yep. um, we have a couple other meetings, but, um, I'm going to schedule another kind of bonus episode, like a, another sure. recording, because I have a couple of uh, questions related to your more investment experience. Sure. Um, so yeah, anytime. I'll, I'll add that to this, uh, to this recording later on, but, um, yeah, right now for the last couple of minutes, Raj usually ends with a, with a pretty interesting question. So sure. Raj. Oh, uh, Raj, you're, you might be on mute. Yeah, sorry about that, guys. And I, I apologize, Ali. Um, we've had a lot of stuff going on as well as, as founders and startups. Um, yeah. I love the guy Raz, how I built it. Percentage wise, luck versus hard work. Oof. When you, okay, so I think hard work has to be 100%, right? And and you got to hope the the luck are the things you can't control. Yeah. Right. So the hard work is the only thing you can control. So you got to put hundred percent into that. Knowing that you're trying to position yourself so that 
if and when that luck formula or whatever it is comes you're ready to go you're ready that's 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 it that's i mean i think you have to put it all all in the hard work because again it goes back to what you can control and what you can't um it's funny that one of my friends once told me he goes hope is an interesting word yeah and i said and i said what do you mean and he goes you tend to have more hope when things are really bad (laughs) and i'm like oh that's an interesting way to look at it because when things are going as well as you think they can do you you really need hope no so and you most likely have control of the situation exactly exactly so control what you can do your best put in put in put in the hard work but know that you know you can put a hundred percent and maybe things don't align but if they do at least you're you're set up for it right so i'd go 100 percent, 100 percent hard work and hope the luck hits all right let's close to some of the other answers we've gotten over the last couple of interviews but amazing yeah. <laughs> ali thank you so much uh this is not going to be the end of this recording we will uh, sure. add another snippet uh, which we're, will get recorded very soon but um again thanks so much for coming and for spending this time so far um uh, uh for our viewers so um you know we'll see you again next week but in case you're looking for any kind of spe- specialist advisors or executives like ali um, these are people in our network who we've taken the time to understand what they're looking for and what their ideal founder fit. So if there's somebody that we can assist with, schedule a free 20 minute conversation through our website and either Raj and myself will be happy to get you matched. So we are back for part two. Unfortunately, we had to cut the last episode a little short, but Ali, thank you so much for uh, rejoining us. And we're, we're super excited yeah, sure. to get some of the, uh, these later, um, uh, viewpoints in because in the last episode we were um, we were getting a little detailed in terms of like based on all the all the different scenarios you've seen both on the founder side and on the investor yep. side you were well let, let's start off on the investor side first because I yep. feel like we don't really get that much info um, as often but on yep. the investor side, you may you had an interesting point where even investors like can get screwed over with terms or in certain cases. Would you mind ex- expanding on that? Yeah, I mean, and th- there's so many different um, examples to show out there, and I think one of the challenges we we face overall is that the tech ecosystem is kind of talked about everywhere now. Right. And it's almost like if everybody's not an investor, their best friend at least is. And if everybody's not a a founder of a startup, they know a handful of people that are. So it's it's like so much in our face. Um, and it's and so much of it is consumer facing that I think there's there's a lot of misconceptions out there of how the whole startup world works, how investing works how starting up a company works. Um, and it's almost like the cool thing to do from, from all angles. And to be able to decipher between what's legit and what's not, I mean, not that, not that everybody that is successful or unsuccessful is, makes them legitimate or not. I, I, that's not what I mean, but there's just a lot of noise. There's a lot of noise. And there's equally as much noise for the founders looking to identify the right investors as there is investor or investors trying to navigate all the noise into finding the right investment opportunities. And, and that's, and that's what um, people don't see. I, I really believe, and I've been saying this for a long, long time, I think, and this goes back to, to, you know, as long as I've been involved in, in tech startups in Silicon Valley, I'm more so down in, in Southern California now, but it's the same thing. There's, there's this perception that investing in tech, um, you're hanging out at Starbucks one day and you're just chilling over there and you end up, you know, talking to somebody next to you and they're telling you about a startup that, that you worked in and you give them 20 grand. And then, you know, a year later, it turns out to be Uber. And, you know, that's that it's kind of like a, a fantasy that's out there. And, and a lot of people, a lot of people, both on the founder side and on the investor side, that's really what they believe 
works and that's how they believe it is. And it's, it's so much more than that. There's so much more structure out there. So um, I, I think we have to educate people. I, I think we have to tell, share with them how it really works though, that meeting the, you know, being the first $20,000 check into Uber because you found somebody at Starbucks can happen. Right. But that's not the norm. That's not how it, how it really works. So it feels like that would be, that would happen more so for like an angel investor or somebody who's just there in the right absolutely. Place time. But if you're thinking about the, the, your LPs and then where you need to deploy capital and then your existing portfolio companies, it, it gets really busy very fast. So. It's a, it's a sophisticated process. Right. And, and I don't think um, everybody has a good understanding of the value of the, of the venture ecosystem itself and the investment and the financial ecosystem within a tech ecosystem, right? Um, it just because someone has deep pockets doesn't make them a sophisticated investor, right? And just because someone has a cool new idea for a uh, startup company doesn't necessarily make them qualified to execute it correctly either, right? Um, but, you know, it's so much a part of our all of our everyday lives um, that it's hard not to get excited about it from either end, right? And and again, it's because technology has become so consumer facing, right? So if we go back twenty years ago, the innovations in technology were very much so limited to within the technology industry, right? Now now technology. And innovation has kind of infiltrated every single industry, and it's so consumer facing um, that it's it's hard not and it's exciting. It's hard not to get caught up in that. So you you see a lot of mistakes, and and mistakes are just fundamental things, right? I I, I love the fact that people are excited to invest and in, support entrepreneurs and all that, right? I think that's good. I love the fact that there's people entrepreneurs out there building teams and creating new companies and, and doing all that. Um, but the steps you take along the way, uh, no matter what your intention is in, in achieving and how positive that may be, if you take the wrong steps, it just, it can be really catastrophic to even having a chance. Right. And I think that's what we touched on last time that you can do all the right things. Everything can be perfect, but still things have to line up. And if you don't take the right steps, that just lowers your odds. And uh, I, I feel like um, just, just as a quick refresher for our, our viewers. So Ali has been a part of syndicates before they were cool. He's been yep. a part of angel groups before they were organized. And he's been mm -hmm. a part of VC, like GP teams before they became, actually became VC. So yeah, this kind yeah. of insight that you're you're receiving over here is, is very, very unique. Um, yeah. And a, a quick point, Ali, I wanted to get your, your input on this. So considering the down market today, right? Mm -hmm. you, you've, you've, uh, you've handled a lot of angels and a lot of VCs through up and down markets. Um, any, any thoughts on, on how, how, let's say, angel investors or LPs who are interested in investing in startups, how should they be thinking about this current market and atmosphere? This is the best time to invest, especially if if you're interested in or active in investing at the early stages. So if you go back and we and we had something together, I can I can try to pull it up while we're talking. Um, but we 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 looked at just pulling up a handful of even companies at different times of downturns, and you realize some of the biggest companies are actually started during the worst economic times, right? And there's there's a few main reasons for that. Number one, when the economy is bad, it really exposes what the true problems that need to be solved are, right? What are the real business propositions? Not just creating a new company and, you know, everybody's jumping on the bag wagon. I mean, we, we, we've gone through this just recently and we see how the, the, Everybody's talking about how there's no more VC dollars, VC, venture capitalists. It's relative to how they were spending the money leading up to this in the last two, three years, right? There was so, comp so much competition 
in and so much available capital, and that ties into low interest rates and all of that. There was so much that creates so much competition to invest. There is a finite number of companies to invest in, and we have more competition going after those investors, those, those investment opportunities, what does it do? It raises valuations um, up and eventually gets to a point where it's not sustainable, right? So we, we experienced this in the dot-com era, right? Companies were just raising money based on user acquisition. That's it. Nobody had a plan for profitability. Companies were raising money hand over fist. I remember companies giving away cars to attract employees because they needed the manpower to execute based on all this money that they raised just to, just to acquire users, right? Eventually, when it became clear there was no path to profitability, that's where the returns would come in, right? So what happened? It tightened up on the investment side. So when things tighten up, it doesn't mean investors go away. It just means they're looking at companies that are solving a true problem, right? And that makes them more conservative in investing, which then leads to why it's valuable for investors to be involved at these times, because when the power shifts to the investors, they're becoming more cautious, more selective in their investments. There's less, there's less competition fighting over the same deal, artificially inflating valuations. Valuations are coming down. So investor, investors end up actually getting a better deal during these times. And because those investment dollars end up at being allocated to companies that are solving real problems, there's a greater opportunity for success as well, as opposed to just everybody raising money. You know, so um, I think for people that are are investing at this time, it, it's great. I mean, you look back um, at some of the companies. I'll I'll find the list here and I'll pull it up. I jotted it down um, several weeks ago, um, but it's it's a good time to be involved, I think. But it's again, where, where do you plan to get involved and where where do you want to be in and make sure you're aligned with the right opportunities, not just going out there and trying to figure out which ones are those are are on your own. That's hard to do. Yeah, there's um actually I think there's an argument to be made that over the last couple of years, for example, with cheaper financing available people were able to raise more money, but at higher valuations without realizing that they were screwing themselves over. Completely the screwing round. themselves over. Yeah, yeah, because it's, it's they're, they're inflated. It's something, raising money at high valuation, if it's justified is fine, right? But if the valuation doesn't make sense, it's literally just a supply and demand thing. At some point that supply and demand issue changes, right? And then your real valuation kind of surfaces, right? So here I, I found the notes I had. Um, we looked at um, just pulling up a handful of companies that were founded during our our last economic downturn. So this is, I 08. think, we looked at 08 to 010. It was just like a two-year span, right? Look at these companies. Let me know if any of these ring a bell. WhatsApp, Venmo, Uber, Airbnb. Pinterest, Instagram, Slack, Square. Like it's it's I don't think it's a coincidence that that those types of companies have a propensity to be founded during um poor economic times because that's when that's when our biggest industry problems get exposed, right? Why do they get exposed? Because when everybody's making tons of money, that the the problems kind of like fall under underneath the rug a little bit right so i think i think it's a really good time and i think um it's also important for investors to to um really align themselves to to where those where those top companies are going to emerge from and i think that's that's important to as, as a strategy to understand awesome. um so 
let's switch modes to like the LP side because I know you've yeah. seen hundreds of those uh, situations. So <clears throat> if let's say you're an angel investor or you're interested in, and you recognize that this is a, the, a good market to get into this, let's say. Yeah. Um, what are you looking for from the GPs or the funds to protect yourself? So you're, you're, you're looking at, you should look at a GP or a fund the same way that you're kind of looking at early stage startup companies, right? You're evaluating the team, you're evaluating the industries they focus on. Um, you're looking at track record. You're looking at other companies they've been involved with. Um, you're looking at who their other LPs are, right? Um, there's kind of a birds of a feather thing in every industry. Um, good investors tend to follow each other. And um, I don't necessarily think that the bad investors or investors that could even be toxic um, stay around that long and, and they kind of, they kind of push them out. It's, 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 I think important um, to understand you're, you're, you're banking on the GP's expertise in their industry, right? You're banking on their ability to identify and source the best deals. And you're banking on how they're able to support them because they're not going to be the only investor ever involved. You want them to grow and, and all that. So it takes a long time. I mean, I don't, I don't think you just go out and meet a handful of VCs and then say, oh, I like this one and I like this one. And I'm going to go ahead and, and uh, allocate some money to their funds. You know, we, we evaluated before we started investing in NBC in funds. I mean, we built relationships over years and then made the decision to, to invest. Um, because, I mean, just look at this, like if us three were, were a VC fund, right. We're three GPs, um, of a VC fund. We, we invest in early stage, you know, not even complicated stuff, not like hardware or biotech that that's an almost different animal. Let's say we do software companies, right? Early stage software companies. If we were to invest in say 10 to 20 companies over the course of this year through our fund. We're not going to see, we're going to see the majority of our realizations or exits growth. Historically, it shows five to eight years from now. And that's, and that's pretty good. It's actually going further out. Um, so you have to really be patient in identifying which VCs you want to back because in order to see their track record, that, that takes them some time to develop that, right? So, um, and, and we also saw that. So that's, just look at how many different VC funds popped up in the last five, 10 years, right? It's great that we have money going in to support startups, but how many VC funds do you need, <laughs> right? Everybody's chasing after the same deals within the sectors that they're focused on, right? Do we need that many? Do we need that many new ones? I, I don't know. I don't know. Um, but the good ones tend to weather these waves and sustain themselves and, and they stay around. So there's VC funds that we like and, and, and we stick with them and we keep our eyes open for new VC funds that may emerge. But when they do, and we look at building relationships with them and then maintaining that relationship um, for a while. So we're talking years, not months or weeks um, before we get comfortable to, oh, this, this is a VC that we'd like to support. That's a great point. Um, what are your thoughts on uh, these like angel groups and um, uh, kind of pitch to or pay to pitch yeah. sort of works? I don't, I, I've never liked it. And, and this is why I don't like it. And you, it's tough. I, I don't like the fact. Okay. Entrepreneurs and startups 
the one resource that they have the act the absolute least of that they need is capital, right? So this kind of pay to play for especially the early stage ones, this pay to play, um, charging them to pitch, I think um misaligns interests, right? So you and there's a ton of angel groups, and I think angel groups have a lot of value to bring, tons of value. Um, but if they're if they're paying, if the if the entrepreneurs or startups are paying to pitch in front of those angel groups, is the angel group really scrutinizing and 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 filtering out which of the startups they want to pitch to their members? Because that's why the members are paying. Right. I, I think there's a, it's not correct to charge the members to be a part of your group and charge the people to also pitch. It can be done correctly. And I, I get it. There's costs associated with this. I'm just not the biggest fan. You know, I've, I've invested in a company that I made at an angel that I met at a, at an angel group, that company paid to pitch. I ended up investing in them. I like the company the company's still around doing some cool stuff. Um, but I think it would have been better if they pitched without having to pay. Right. It, and um, I don't know. It's, it's tough. It's, 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 it's really tough. I'm, I'm not saying angel groups are bad because they're charging. Um, but in a perfect world, I don't think they should charge the entrepreneurs and startups. Yeah. There's a, um, I used to say hear this all the time where, you know, uh, people used to say you have to pay to play. Um, it's this yeah. really silly kind of line from, you know, like old banking and stuff. But it's like if you're you're actively creating an environment for early stage founders or, or early stage startups to be comfortable presenting and pitching yeah. their vision to you. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then as some of those fees, even now we um, uh, with the new startup I'm with, we uh, because they're part of a couple of good angel or sorry, uh, accelerated programs and the founder is has a really good background. The number of cold emails he gets just asking like, hey, I'm part of this angel network. Hey, I'm doing this. Uh, some of them even have created conferences around it saying that if you're going to pay us, you know, here's the ticket to pitch. But it's it's pretty much the same thing. Um, so here's here's my philosophy in regards to the whole ecosystem. Right. And this. And I'll give you examples of why why I believe this is important. You guys can decide if it makes sense for you or not, or whoever's watching. Um, the same thing of that pay to play. This you you pay us X amount of dollars, and we'll let you. Or if you're qualified, we'll let you pay us so you can pitch, right? Um, to our members, or whatever it may be. Um, I've seen that happen where. Okay, we have we have tech startups popping up everywhere, right? And wherever they start is going to be in some geographic location, right? Whether they start in whether it's a new ag tech company popping out of Idaho, or it's a new tech company out of Silicon Valley, or somewhere out at something out of Austin or LA or Miami or overseas, it doesn't matter, right? They're there's there's somewhere. So in order and tech companies have a tremendous impact to local regions right so there's there's a there's a need for these companies to have a conduit to be able to expand into different regions both domestically where they are and internationally to them there are groups out there there are groups out there that will invest in a company here, they'll say Raja and and say for starting a company, and they meet so and so investor, and the investor puts some money in their company, right? That same investor, and I've seen this, I've like literally seen this, and it doesn't make any sense. That same investor, after having invested in the company, will will say that okay, we have the infrastructure, the relationships, um, the ability to quickly expand you into this region, right? And that could be overseas, internationally, right? Could be one or more countries internationally. 
And that what sounds exciting for, for a tech startup, right? Growth, growth is good. Growth, growth extends their valuation. There's only so much they can, you can do as a startup. You have to kind of focus in on your market and then figure it out and kind of expand that way. And then all of a sudden this shiny, um, this carrot is kind of dangled in front of you that, oh, we can increase your valuation. We can have you in such and such com country. Their population is this, this market is this size, the total addressable market just in this region. It'll bump your valuation, blah, blah, blah. And then you know what the investor wants to do? They want to create a joint venture or a different entity, have a big chunk of that new entity, right? in exchange for helping accelerate that company's growth. How does that work? How does that work? Because if that investor has a piece of the, say the US entity, right? And that piece is maybe X percent, but they're saying we're gonna create a new entity that you'll own, you'll own a chunk of too, but we're gonna have a big chunk. Where's the interest of the, of the investor, right? He wants his bigger chunk. To grow because he has a bigger piece so he might his the the interests aren't aligned that investor actually might be incentivized now that the parent company the main company the original one does not do well and their focus is on that so there's so much of this of this stuff going on which goes back to regardless if it's an angel group regardless if it's a investor regardless if it's an expansion opportunity a partnership opportunity a, a um, rev sharing opportunity, right? Everything should be done that is in the best interest of the entrepreneur and the, and the base company, right? And so that's, that's kind of my philosophy on things. When I, when I see these pay to play kind of things and, um, oh, it's an opportunity to expand, but you got to give us this much of this. And it's like, that doesn't make sense. You already have a piece of the company here grow that company, you already have a piece. Why do you have to create something new to have a bigger piece of so you can just take it all? How, how are the interests aligned? So you have to be careful for these kinds of things because they sound cool. Believe me, it sounds cool. You know, when you're a startup and, and your own investor, somebody's giving you money, comes and says, hey, we can do this in this country. Um, and I'm, I'm going to take this much and you, and you keep this and don't worry, even a little piece of this is going to be a lot for you. I mean, well, so that's interesting. I've seen that happen more in like, so in Pakistan, because yeah. a lot of those founders aren't able to do business outside of the country, right? So they'll need right. somebody like, I, I'm a dual citizen. For me, incorporating the US and then having yeah. a sister company in Pakistan and then expanding outside is a little easier than it would be for them. But it becomes just kind of like an exclusive partnership or exclusive license that yeah. You as the founder now have to give this other sister company, which is being run completely autonomously and out without your control, but is built upon what you have. Yeah, so it's a very Not, weird situation. Very weird. And the, and I guess my in summary about like the angel groups and all that, um, I've always kind of advised founders and startups that if you find some that are even charging for you to present and you, it's not, it's not a bad thing. Like I said, I, you know, invested in a company, um, about a year and a half ago that I originally met, um, at one of these, um, pitch gatherings, right. Where they paid. Um, so there, there is value to that. Um, but what I also advise for those startups and founders that do go and pitch spend your time in the audience, right? Because I believe for the most part, the founders all have good intentions. They're, you know, passionate about their company. They're trying to raise money and, and, and whatnot. If the structure of the angel group required them to pay and they were comfortable with that, great, no problem. Um, but it's who you meet at those events that can be, that can be pretty interesting. And, and um, there's a lot of value I, I almost believe that just just paying to to present it at those organizations um, in exchange for you know who you may meet that's attending there that could be end up being a, a good even if they're not an investor sometimes you can find great advisors even there too because there's there's people there for the same positive reasons. Hmm. 
Ollie, would you put, I guess, kind of the pay to play thing? Because, and Seth and I were talking about this the other day. Yeah. What about the broker? Because a lot of times that's their business. But yeah, that it, the brokers have kind of like a, it's weird. It's it almost like they almost look like a, a, uh, Used car salesmen, yeah, no, for connecting I mean, deals. I think that's the that's the image they have. Um, but I don't think I don't think um, they're necessarily bad brokers. Brokers where where they have a lot of value is, although they may not be, for example, and all of us are kind of um, not exposed to the broker side as much because we've been so involved in tech ecosystems that have VCs that have all this that and you even if you don't have the direct relationships to get in front of the right investors there's these angel groups there's these meetups there's the someone you know has a relationship with the VC that can introduce you to like you don't need the broker right it's there's so much opportunity um, to connect with potential investors. But where brokers have a value is um, connecting those opportunities with, in, with investors that um, we don't have access to that aren't in the ecosystem, right? And a lot of times, I think the, the image that brokers have is they're just trying to take a cut. Um, I, I think what they are is that they may not be specialists in your industry, right? Um, but they have access to investors, some of which might be looking to get involved in companies like yours. And they're just, they're just facilitating that introduction and they're licensed, right? That's, yeah. that's why you can get a fee. I can't, I can't go out there find a startup I really like, and then share it with other people and ask for a fee. I can't do it. I'm not a broker. It's not, it's not what I do. Um, but that's, that's their job. They're, they're licensed to do that. So that's, that's okay. They're not always, they're not always the experts, right? So you see a lot of, um, there's different ways of investing in different industries and it doesn't really translate one-to-one. So the terminologies are different. Um, things like that. So there's a little bit of disconnect, but, you know, people use brokers to bring them deals. Right. And, um, you know, for somebody that hasn't been involved in tech, that's in the region that maybe they're investing in different types of industries or, or different things, they may have their financial advisor or their broker, whoever it may be that's, that's looking at and share something with them in tech. So it's it's not necessarily bad. We we just we're just not as accustomed to it. I think in in our regions in our sector because the the financing infrastructure is, is there and established with VCs, with angel groups, with syndicates, with all with with just angel investors on their own. We have so much of it. I don't think the the presence of a broker is something that we've we've become established connected with, but that, that exists in, you know, a lot of other parts of, of the world. But again, is it, there could be shady people in, in every industry. So, you know, is it established reputable broker? Or do they have the best interest of their, um, their clients in mind? Do they have the best interest of the startup in mind? Are they just using you to shop you around for other intentions? The same kind of things that you have to evaluate in, in an investor. And then that's an interesting you too. Be because careful with what you got to be careful with is as a startup, though, is the person that that presents themselves as a broker and is asking you for a fee based on success, right? And they're not licensed, and they and they don't they don't realize that they can't do that, right? That that I see a lot of. That I see a lot of the the people trying to connect these dots. That oh, I know some rich people, and I you know I, I'm meeting people that are doing startups. Uh, if they come up to an entrepreneur or startup and say, Hey, if I find you a million dollars, I, I get X percent. Are they a broker? Are they licensed to do that? You got to be careful as a startup because you can't do that.
the SEC is going to come down on you and on on that so-called broker. Absolutely. The, Absolutely. Let's scratch that a little bit more because you, you, you've run the gamut. You're on one side of the pendulum, like, hey, due diligence, VCs, get your accreditation. But then you see it's prolific. Like, I'm two things, to be honest. And and if I know we, you know, so they're bigger topics, but one, dilution in investments for, you know, investors and LPs and the founder kind of going off the rails. Yeah. <laughs> and two, the crowdfunding. We we're working with a group now, and they're they're doing some real estate plays, and they're doing SPVs for. Ali, they're spinning up SPVs for, <laughs> like rounding errors of numbers, and 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 it's such an interesting dynamic. Now I understand we can throw every word of democratization in the broad group, blah, 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 but the reality of the situation is exactly what you said. It could be a double edged sword. Stay in your lane until you're ready to not. I guess exactly, exactly. You know, and and crowdfunding is interesting. I've always felt like crowdfunding is a better measurement of a company's marketing um, abilities than necessarily their the value Actual. of the company. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Because think about it: you're who is the best at putting value on a company? It's the experts in that industry, right? But if you're just put, if you're basing your value on how much you can raise from what we'll call the retail network, meaning consumers, yep. and not in a disparaging way, not in no, but it's they're not the experts, right? Of course, of but, course. So I'll, I, I'll give you another one of my philosophies, and, and I want to share because I, I want to help, based on what I've learned over time. Any of this advice, if it helps entrepreneurs and founders, great. Um, and at the same time, from our investment experience, if it helps investors. So I I do not do deals unless there's a VC leading it. That simple, that simple. It's and it's it's not because I don't believe you can find a deal on your own. I just believe you have a better chance of long-term success. If you're in a deal that has an experienced expert investor involved, right? Um, and if you guys are numbers guys, I'd, I'd love to take you guys through an example of how that, how and why that works. Please. Right. So I was about to say, I'd love to hear it. Yeah. So like, and I can't remember if we touched on this in the last episode, but I, I, I think it's a good thing to go. And I'll leave it and I'll leave for the, for the, for the teams and everybody listening yeah. in. If they're not numbers, guys, let's try and keep it cursory. Simple. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So <laughs> it's like, this is exactly how I do it. <laughs> and so if, if you, if you were to ask people and I'm talking about people in those, in that angel investor category, right. Where they have some money to invest. They like tech. They like investing in, in startups. They know that technology and innovation is a, is a big opportunity and whatnot. Um, how many, how many companies do, does an average person that's investing maybe in a company or two on their own as an angel, um, how many companies are they looking at every year before they, before they pick a couple, right? And then how many companies, depending on, you know, the one or two companies that they may have picked, how many companies within that exact industry, that sector, do you think they looked at? To yeah. pick one or two, right? Yeah. And maybe they're looking at a lot, but there is no way they're looking as the same amount. Me. Yeah. Yeah. So how the numbers end up working out, and the, and the best way to understand it is a an early stage VC that invests in like one company a month, you know, like 10, 15 companies a year, they probably look at between two to three thousand companies to pick those 15, right? So what does that mean? That means they're the experts, right? They know the industry better than anyone or just as good as anyone. They're looking at a lot of deals and they're, they're picking the less than 1%, call it 1%, that they feel give them the best chance of success, right? Under, under half a percent. Yeah, no, it's insane. It's insane. 
So that under half of percent tells you two things. One, even though they picked what they thought were the best, what they identified as the best, what do you think their hit rate is? <laughs> One to <of> 10. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Between the power rule. So a tenth, yeah. a tenth of that 0.4% basically is, is what's going to win. Is, is what's going to win, right? Now, the rest of us. Will you stop scaring me, Ali? No, this is, this is, this is exactly how the numbers work out. bullshit, man. The rest man. of us. The rest of us are picking just a couple. Say, just say, right? <laughs> it's exactly. It. Bitch, I'm a VC. What's up? Where, where are we at? Yeah. <laughs> the rest of us are picking a couple of companies to invest in, right? Which group do you think our two companies, you three, us three picked some companies, right? We two. Which group do you think our six companies were picked out of? Did we pick from the same 15? that they picked from, or do you think we picked from the 1,985 that they passed on? Yeah. Right? So we picked from the from the rejects, not that they're bad, they just have less of a chance I, as identified by the experts. How do you think our batting average is gonna be better than one out of 10? And you have to get up to bat, like you have to see those 2,000. Let's be real. Yeah, yeah. we're not even gonna see the 2,000. Mm-hmm. We're, we're seeing a, a small, 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 percentage of of those ones that the vc passed on right and then we're what is how can we have an expectation to do better than the vc so then i'm going to go consumer behavior psychology with you and ali yep. please this is it could, yeah. be pers- it could be personal so give me one of those yep then why is there all this pontification of linkedin of anyone being an angel investor i would love to know their batting their hit rates like where's the everybody reality? likes the likes everybody likes the likes it's just attention. It's the same thing. It's it's this. I heard it. I heard it phrased really well. It, it was a um, an article I read a few years ago, um, and this this guy did a study of and this this applied to LinkedIn. This applied to all types of social media. And and he said and basically what he did is he stripped himself of all things um, that had him connected from his phone, laptop, everything. For like a period of two weeks and went back into society to function <laughs> right with without all these things that keep us digitally connected 24 7 and then he wrote this really cool article of what his um findings were and a couple of things stood out that that um I'll never forget. I forgot all the details of the article, but some of his main points. One of his main points was that. Oh, like, do you randomly remember his name? Because that seems. Really I don't. I don't. It was an awesome article. It was an. Seems awesome. really interesting. It really. Yeah, does. he's all like, I'm just going to disconnect myself, and then I'm going to go out into society and see how I function, <laughs> right? And so he did that, and then for two weeks, it was like two or three weeks, and he came back, and then he wrote his uh, about his findings. The two things that I remember most about that article was number one. He said that he felt like he was the weirdo in society, that it was kind of hard for him to fit in anywhere because if he was on public transportation or he was hanging out at a bar even or whatever, everybody has the ability to go on their phone and and, and he didn't have that because he wouldn't take his phone with him anywhere. He, he literally disconnected digitally, right? And he said, it was hard for me to fit in I look like the weirdo everywhere. So that was his one point. Then he had this, this other saying that I, I'm like, oh, dude, this guy just nailed it. And he, he said what he realized, whether it's on LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, and take whatever. Um, he goes, people live the Photoshopped versions of themselves on social media. Of course they do. Right. And so, and, and that you can physically put filters. You can physically put filters. Like at that point, I'm like, I just said, are you a cat? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ex- exactly. Like Ali, exactly, Ali, right? I, I saw you yesterday when you were like, you weren't a cat. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> and and that that all exists, and that's part of this noise that people, yeah. whether it's you're an entrepreneur, whether you're an investor, you're filtering through. Everybody online is an expert and doing and doing everything successfully, you know, and. And I'm not going to say VCs aren't aren't guilty of that too, right? VCs have their portfolios listed, and they they share 
stories when milestones are achieved or successes achieved by their existing portfolio or past portfolio companies, right? Are they going to be sharing the strikeouts? No. Hell no. Are those going to be on their portfolio? You know, no. They're going to put the ones that are, you know, either active, they're still going, they've had an exit or something notable about them. Nothing that, that you know, those 80 to 90% that did, didn't quite work. Right. So I think we, we forget that when we're, when we're online, you know, that, and, and I agree with you. I mean, you, you're absolutely right. Everybody's an angel investor. Everybody's doing this. I, I don't think that's the case in reality. I think it, it appears to be that way on, on social media. I, th I think that you stick to the basics. I mean, what, um, what we did when, um, we were coming up with our funds investment strategies. We just wanted to cr create some normalcy and simplicity on helping people to figure out and have a have access to to figure out how to invest through all this noise. You know, there's there's a lot of angel investors out there that are really trying to invest in good companies, right? They have completely good intentions. They have some money. They're excited about tech. They want to support entrepreneurs, that, but they don't know how to best do that, right? And and if they are not doing it in the best way, then it hurts even their investors, like and, and their investments, I'm sorry. It, it even hurts the companies that they're investing into, right? Because there are good companies out there that if they get their capital raises done by the correct investors, investors that can help them, them more, they have a better chance of success rather than just raising some money, you know, and, and I've seen that I've, I've seen good companies die because they just had bad investors that at minimum gave them bad advice, let alone, maybe they even had other intentions, but it's, it's a crazy world. It's a crazy world. And it's, and it's, but it's exciting. I think that's, everybody gets in it for good intentions. And, you know, not everybody, but for the most part, but you gotta you gotta be careful of who's really who's really got your best interests in mind, you know. And and, and again, it goes back to the, the example that we started this discussion on the these angel groups. I think they're great, right? I think they're great. They're trying to they're trying to bring some unity and you know to each of their groups. Create a process. How are we going to look at companies? How are we going to filter them? Which ones are we gonna we gonna have? present and all that they're bringing value they're trying to they're trying they're trying to do um they're trying to do the right things you know and and yeah okay if they decide they want to charge although i'm i'm not for that i, I don't think that's necessarily a bad i don't think anybody's getting rich off of charging somebody a few hundred bucks to to present right um but does it really provide as much value as they could to their angel group. I don't know. I don't know. You know, I've, I've been to, here's, here's another example. I've, I've attended angel groups where I've ended up investing in the company. I've attended angel groups where they've done pitches and I've turned around the way this, uh, I got to set it up the way the, the format of the, of the presentation went is they brought they brought the people that were either members or were invited to participate in the audience. So I was invited. I'd heard about this group and I went and they would bring the companies and then they would, they would, the companies would present in front of the group. They had their, you know, certain amount of time, whatever, and you had a set amount of time for questions. <clears throat> and then the, the companies would leave completely. Right. And then it became kind of like an internal discussion of, you know, what we thought about those companies. And there was a company that presented, right? And um, I forget, it was, it was, they were trying to do some kind of device. And I forget specifically what it was, but I had seen a lot of companies that were presenting similar things as I'd been exposed to that. And I knew why investing in those types of companies is not a good choice. And, and why it's not a good investment opportunity, regardless of the company. They could have been the greatest team, whatever. 
it was just not something you back. And so I had a little bit of experience in that, in that one sector of one of the companies that was presenting. And, and I shared that, right? And I shared my reasons of why this is not something that I would recommend to anybody in the group. Um, and another guy chimed in and he goes, yeah, yeah, yeah. I've, 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 I've been exposed to that as well. This does not work. This does not work. And I turned around and I'm like, yeah, why are we even looking at this company? And that's when I stepped on somebody's toes, right? Because they were, they were getting paid just to bring in, um, somebody. Vegetable company. Yeah. So where's, where's the value to the, to the group, right? People are, are there because they. That's so fucking, sorry. It's so bad. It's so So bad, right? Frustrating. No, as a founder, who's like, great. Here's some traction. Some people like what I'm doing. Here's this false narrative, this false hope. I'm doing it. Let me double down on this because this person likes it. Instead of them turning around being like, what? Yeah. Eh? No, the pet rock won't work like enough. Yeah, it was, it's, it's maybe, it may be a bad example maybe a bad example yeah yeah <laughs> but you get it i think i think you totally get it it's like it's not fair everybody to- loses everybody loses. everybody loses everybody loses and and i was pleasantly surprised that that the other guy came you know he was there because he wanted to see good deals and he saw something when i shared he jumped right in and goes oh yeah this is not good this is not good because he had experience he knew he had more experience than me i just started the conversation right and then and then it was like, wait a second, why did it get to this stage? If who's who's evaluating these these deals, right? Because I just came because I was invited, but that other guy had paid to be a member, right? So he's paying because he's expecting to get curated investment opportunities for him to look at. He was pissed. He was pissed off. I was just there sharing some some of my points. I hadn't paid, right? He was pissed. So it's like you said, it's not, it's not fair to anybody. So we're throwing a lot of salt here and as we should. Yeah. Don't make me in fetal position as a founder tonight and cry. Yeah. Where do I find the Ollie's? Where do I find the people are like, listen, I've seen the bullshit. I'm, I'm drinking the Kool-Aid or I'm drinking the, my watering hole is filtered out NFX lists or it's, you know, like what, where am I going? Because candidly, I'll, I'll, I'll project, I'll use the insecurities and project a non-technical founder moving yep. to a new state, moving yep. to a non-networked area that they know, completely removed from an industry they were before, successful, you know, and kind of knows what they're doing, can bullshit their way, throw that spaghetti. But yeah. they're kind of they're at they're like they're at the stage of, yeah, I was in finance, but I don't know tech VC. So the broker things make sense, but maybe they don't. So yeah. like where does that, where is that pocket? And Again, I'm sure there's no panacea. I totally get that. Yeah. But where are you swimming? Us ourselves? Yeah, the people like you who are like who will who will go into an who will go into yeah. an angel funding meeting and be like, why am I here? Like that's the person I want to talk to, to be honest. Yeah, yeah. Because you don't want you don't have time to waste. Right? No. What he does. And you don't have the resources to it. I was about to say, or, or another 10 grand to fucking do the next weekend. Yeah. Yeah. Um you know, I, I know there's no good answer. I probably I think, I no, I think, I think if you can find a way to attend events are always good. Right. Um, I think focusing on the audience is very important. Right. Um, a lot of time, whoever is hosting the event may or may not have your best interests in mind, right? Like we just discussed, but it doesn't mean the people who are there good are point. good. Right? Point. Damn good. So, point. so spending your time networking and connecting with the right people in there, in the audience is huge, is huge. How many, how many, I don't, I don't know how many companies that present end up getting a check right there (laughs) i think that's what it's it's kind of like showcased to be um but i i always think there's a lot of value in the audiences so the the events are good um 
and I and I think understanding who and where your um, competitors have raised money from is helpful too. And find out where where those investors and the VCs where are they hanging out? What are they doing? You know, um, it's it's such a it's such a noisy noisy place to navigate. I mean, you know, it's you know what's crazy? There's there are actually you know how we have pitch events and all that for um, startups. There's there's pitch events for VCs. VCs pitching their next fund and and all that. You know, yeah. um, it's just you just you just have to you have to go to events, go to good events. You end up doing enough of that. You meet a lot of people. Out of those, you t- typically meet a few people, and then through that, you end up connecting. Because the few good people that you meet, they tend to also work with good people. And that, and that builds, builds your circle. We, <clears throat> we started a RVC fund and, and people come up to me because they got a startup and whatever. And they say, oh, you know, I, I know you're managing, managing a small fund. Can I pitch your idea to you? And, and, and I say, yeah, and I'm always happy to look at it and take a look. But we don't actually invest directly into, other, into companies. We, we invest in VC funds. That's where we spend our time figuring out who the best VC funds are. So when I, the reason I like meeting with companies is if I say, oh, this is interesting, then I can introduce them to a fund that I like, right? And then they get right in um, through the front door if it makes sense for, for that VC fund. If it doesn't, I know that it wasn't good anyways. It didn't meet the criteria, not that it wasn't good, it didn't meet the criteria that they were looking for at this time. So when we were developing, so we are a fund of funds. When we were developing that strategy, once we identified a few funds that we liked, it was actually through the relationships of those funds that we met the other funds. Because they, they're they all friends, right? The good guys, the good guys stick together. Um, and so that's, that's, that's kind of how our whole pl- platform came to fruition, but it started by attending these events, by going and meeting people, by sharing what we have done in the past and our experience. So we, they knew that we understood um, the whole industry and everything, and then got to build relationships. And again, literally over the course of years, um, building these relationships. So it takes time. It takes time. And it's the same thing for a founder. You know, they got to go through, they got to go through that process. You brought up a very interesting point, which often goes overlooked, and that's analyzing your competitors for their funding sources. Yeah. And a lot yeah. of founders actually will not, will, will, will have, a, have an eye on their competitors, but more so from a customer standpoint or yes. from a market standpoint. But a lot of people don't really realize that it's the same VCs who are operating. They probably have invested in multiple different um uh, multiple different um, competitors, uh, even well, YC that, does this, right? Like where where they keep them at arm's length. Yeah, most most VCs um, will not invest in competitive um, companies, right? But when you identify a VC that has invested in a competitor, you can then research who are the competitors to that VC. Yep. Right. So and and cite that signal for that next VC. Exactly. Exactly. Because the fact that the the fact that your competitor has raised money, people a lot of people think, oh, you know, there's competition, they raise money. This is bad for me. No, it's good. It's validating that you're in the right market market, right? That's always good. It's when there's no money flowing into your industry that you should be worried. I remember every competitor slide on the deck, they're like, hey, show your competitors getting funded. Because if you're UVP, who gives a fuck? Yeah, absolutely. And so finding out um, who that competitors, VCs, competitors are, maybe they don't have somebody. They haven't picked a portfolio company in your sector and, and maybe they're still looking. That might be an opportunity for you, right? And so, and and stay within your sector. I think I think that's 
that's something that um, the founder's most scarce resource is capital, right? They need capital to do so much. And they're always trying to raise money, which is great. You got to always be raising money. But don't think that just because somebody is an investor or VC, just because they have money that you should be pitching to them. Yeah. You know, you have to, they have, they have a target market that they're going after as far as in, investments go. Um, and if, and if you're not in their sectors that they invest in or stage or whatever it may be, um, you know, don't, don't try to force it, you know, and it, I don't, it doesn't happen. So let's switch gears a little. So sure. let's say you're a founder, yeah. you've done the research, you've, you've looked at the competitors and, and um, people too, but how, like, based on the terms that you've seen, right? And we know VCs, they, they're sweet talkers, many of them are salespeople. Their job is to the find best. the best companies and then also make noise because not only for their LPs, but then in general, right? A lot of VCs consider themselves like marketing and sales channels for these founders. But on the founder side, like, you've identified these angels or VCs to work with, but you still, I mean, until you build a relationship, let's say you're a founder who needs to raise money for pretty fast. You don't have time yeah. to build, uh, you know, the relationship for the next round, maybe, or, or that's, that's part of your mindset, but you need to close in three, six months or 12 months. What are some like red flags, which a, a founder should be looking out for not only in during the, let's say, the dating phase, but then also when it comes down to the prenup or to the to the actual term sheet. Um, that even the, the dating phase, I think we we slightly touched on this in our last conversation. Is good VCs don't play games, right? They don't drag you out. The bad VCs, you know, or the people that claim they're VCs, but they're just they're not, they, they have money to invest, whether it's theirs or they're investing somebody else's money. We don't know. Sometimes um, they may tack on the name that they're a VC, whether they are or not. We talked about that. They may or may not be a fun, all of that stuff. They just present themselves that they are. We talked about if they're trying to wow you with what makes them so great all the time, that's kind of a red flag. Another red flag is that they're dragging it out. Um, so that's, that's kind of in the dating phase. Um, remember good VCs are looking at, you know, a few thousand deals a, a year to pick that half a percent. They don't have time to fucking drag people around. <laughs> they don't have time, right? It's like, they can't be like wasting their own time, let alone yours. So those are the red flags. Um, terms are, are pretty straightforward, right? Um, and one thing that is a big red flag, if you get any hint of that investor, whether they claim they're a VC or whatever, whatever title they put on themselves, is trying to monetize through you. Mm. As opposed to, and that sounds weird, as opposed to monetizing by building value in the company that they're going to be investing in. Okay. And here's an example. I mean, these are real world examples that I saw. I've seen, I've seen startup companies that have come up to me and said, Hey, you know, our investor did this. They gave us this much money um, on these terms, but they also required us that we use their services for this and we pay them X amount of dollars every month. That's a fucking flag, dude. The advisor network or service. Just anything, anything. It's like, why are you milking money out of the startup? <laughs> you should, you should be building value into the startup through your resources, which is one contributing capital and any other resources that you can help bring to this company to make the entity grow in value, not milking out these 
these service type fees, whether it could be for professional services, for advisory, for, for um, pay even. I mean, you see it a lot. Those, those types of things I think are red flags. Um, excessive warrants. Warrants are, are okay, but excessive warrants could be a red flag. Um, I think pro rata rights are good. I think that's a good sign that, um, so like what are pro rata rights for people that might be watching and, and they don't know? Pro rata rights is just an opportunity to continue to invest in the company at subsequent rounds so that you're able to maintain your ownership level, right? So it's a way to, why would you want to do that? Because if the company's growing, more rounds of investment means people get diluted, right? Over time. Well, if you already have investors in that backed you from the beginning and those and they're they they're backing you because they believe in the company, they want to grow, they should have an opportunity if they can afford it to continue to maintain their equity stake on the future rounds at the same terms as the future rounds, right? That's all pro rata is. And so those those are good. Um the only thing you might want to be aware of is um them being to block any any new investors like they get too much control mm -hmm. right or um what's another way it could be done um like right of first refusal or I think right. I mean, right of first refusal is okay. Like if they if they get the first opportunity to invest, they they supported you, but um, you you don't want it to be in a way where they block somebody and then they don't invest in you, right? Um, basic stuff like that. And then and then I've also seen I've also seen post investment, um, sometimes you know, more money is needed by the company because certain things weren't anticipated or happened or more growth than, than even sooner than even anticipated and you need more runway or whatever. Um, just because the investor supported you before um, and if they're sending you terms, make sure you look through that. I, I've, I've seen cases where um, an investor has taken advantage of their own company just because of trust. They knew that, okay, I'm going to send this thing over. We're, you know, pumping in some more money, but they put in something there that like was just going to get overlooked and signed off and wasn't necessarily the best thing for the founders. Mm -hmm. So just, just be aware. And, and what's cool is the, the smart investors, the good VCs, those guys, they want you to, be on top of it and be aware because they they know then you're protecting their investment in other ways too, mm -hmm. right? They're banking on you. Um, it's good that you you run through through things and just because somebody's backed you before doesn't mean they they may not be dishonest or disingenuous at a future time, you know. Um, yeah, the, I mean that you got to be smart about it. You got to be smart about it, and and. The startup world is so dynamic. It requires so many hours. It's, you know, such a, such a grind um, that it leaves, it leaves entrepreneurs um, vulnerable, right? And, you know, that's, that's the tough thing. And so it, you, you've got to be smart. You got to be smart. You got to do everything in the best interest of your company. And you're assuming all your investors are doing that too. And your partners and whatnot. And, you, you got to, you got to always do things that are in the best interest of the company. That's where the fiduciary responsibility comes up. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And that's why I was talking about like, how does it work when one investor comes in, invests in a company then wants to create a separate entity because of, and use the excuse that it's a different country or whatever. And then they're going to own this portion of that. And no, why you're already an owner in this entity. If we're doing something somewhere else, everybody's position should should translate so that the main entity grows and everybody wins. Otherwise, you might have you might be more inclined to the other company <laughs> doing well than you are this one. So how does that work? 
So always you go from a tiny angel or a tiny investor to now all of a sudden like the chairman or president of the new uh, new entity. Yeah. And yeah if, if, shots, so. if 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 people don't think that's that shit goes on, they're wrong. It absolutely does go on. Uh, well, the good news is, uh, you know, there have been plenty of situations uh, that have occurred, I, I guess, more so in North America than in, in more emerging countries. But there are examples, there are resources, there are people that you can reach out to as a founder to be able to review uh, certain terms or certain conversations and things before you sign on the dot. dot. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. You have to. You have to do it smart no matter how much you feel like you need money that's that's the that's the challenge that founders are in right money is always so scarce even if you raise a, the round you were trying to raise right you're still a startup there's so much more to do that was just enough to get you to this next hopefully to the next stage right so it's like you're constantly running and and trying to raise money it's easy to overlook some things and and uh, get get caught up and and you know just just overlook you know and and not be as as critical as you should be but you know just a little bit extra attention um, can mean a lot in protecting your company and and yeah and yourself you know measure measure twice cut once so. yeah exactly exactly. <laughs> That's, Especially when it comes to like your livelihood like that. Yeah. Yeah. No, there's, there's a lot of, for, for all the Googles of the world, the, you know, the Netflixes, the, every brand name that we're all know of that we tie to um, tech and innovation, believe me, there's a million times more of these of these other stories that didn't happen, but it doesn't mean the the founders or the technology or the idea of the company was necessarily inferior. Just the stars didn't align. And sometimes it's just because it didn't align. Sometimes it was because there was one or more things that became toxic and and killed the killed the opportunity. Right. So you get you gotta minimize that as much as you can. Um, in this crazy pace of of the startup world. Wow. No, that was that was absolutely amazing. Thank you so much, Ali. Um, yeah, for sure. We we usually get a lot of insight on the on the founder side, but yeah. now actually on the GP on the LP side, this was this was absolutely tremendous. Thank you. Yeah, um, no, it's it's awesome to have um, discussions on both ends, right? Because there are there are hard things to navigate in 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 the world of startups mm -hmm. right it's it's hard it's 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 not that fantasy that everybody thinks is that you and your your buddy are hanging out and you come up with this idea and you do this and in a couple of years you're on a private jets and and all this it's it's not like that it that those those things happen um, but there's a lot more success stories that that you know we don't even hear of every day, um, and and you know there's a lot there's a lot to be learned in in the whole process, right? And and sometimes you see that too, like VCs, and they, they like the they like the founders that are so passionate about the problem that they're solving over a, a team that may be trying to do the same thing, but they're just, they're more passionate about having that big exit. Mm -hmm. Like if, if, if a VC has an opportunity to pick two companies, same stage, same technology, like identical, right? And one team is just genuinely passionate and the other, the other team just wants to, be really, really rich, they'll pick the passionate team. You know, and, and they're they're trying to they're trying to evaluate that when they're when they're looking at these teams and these companies because at the at the early stage, so many things can change. Right. So um 
there's, there's so many different ways to look at this stuff, but it's always fun to talk about. And it's it's almost impossible to uh, to fake that passion, especially in the early days. Later yeah. on, when you're getting paid and you know you have equity, you have a valuation that supports your ego and uh, the team around you, it gets slightly easier. Obviously, the problems change. But when yeah. you're grinding it out on your own and you know really pursuing something without with all these other external pressures and you know, not even able to support yourself, whether financially, mentally, et cetera, that's where passion is going to get you over the finish line. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And then it's, it, you mentioned ego. That's, that's a crazy thing, right? Because you see, you see companies where that passion at the beginning was awesome. And then it turns into an ego battle, right? So crazy stuff, but always, always enjoy talking to you guys. Thank you so much, Ali. Any other questions, Rod? Love all sides of the coin. I think last so, episode we did do the the luck versus hard work question. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Oh, yeah. We'll we'll skip that for for now. But um, before uh, maybe we we address this last time too. But you know, where can if people are interested to get your feedback or your insight, where can they find you? Reach out to you. <laughs> you know, these are these are this is your show. This is. This is something that you you guys are doing, and and if they find what we had to talk about interesting, um, they should they should reach out to you and um, anybody you want me to talk to, and you think we can be helpful for, um, happy to be connected with them. So, um, if that if that's cool with you, that that's fine with us. They can always if you want to share my contact info, you can do that too. But um, whatever you guys prefer. Thank you so much. Yeah, that's a that's a great kind of plug into the concierge that we have. So uh, for anybody listening who is feeling stuck or is doesn't have really an answer to what they're trying to solve, or let's say they've exhausted their own network and now are trying to branch out, come talk to us uh, on the Startup Studios Concierge. It's a free 20 minute conversation with either Roger or myself and with the intent of Either because we know our network, we know what yeah. they're good at, we what they're bad at, and as an XVC, a project, an ex investor, and as founders, we have some insight into the good and the bad according to you know our own methodology there. But uh, yeah, and I would I would extend that to both the founders as well as um, the investors that are listening. Like if they're if they're figure, trying to figure out how can they improve the process through which they invest, you know, just fine tune it and their strategies to give them a better chance to get into what they would think are better deals. Um, happy to share experiences and, and insight on that as well. So whether they're founders or they're investors, and we can bring some perspective to both. Hey, Ali, it's always a pleasure uh, to reconnect and see you. We really appreciate your time and, and for, uh, for our two part episode today. Yeah, for sure. Awesome. Thank you guys. Have a great Thanks, week. Ali. Later guys. Thank you. Talk soon. Right. Bye-bye. We'll see you next week. Sure.